Yeah, no kidding. Okay, I am talking now. Do we do we know which mic I'm on? Is this are we good? So are we on? Still not on? Okay. One, two, three, we're good now? Is that good? You hear me? Okay. Perfect. Should I you want me to move it closer? Okay, we're good? All right.
as we prepare for worship, we light the Christ candle, remembering that Christ is here in this space. May we breathe in Christ's peace and become Christ's love and joy in the world. Welcome to all, no matter who you are, whether you're in the pews here today or sitting on your couch drinking your coffee, you are welcome in our worship. We are all one community in spirit, and we've come together to praise with joy the world's creator. Although the outdoor temperatures could fool us, we can see from here the transition from summer to fall. I find transitions so intriguing. New seasons, new school years, new jobs, moves, graduations, retirements, new stages of life, all rich with possibility and loss and challenge. Wes and I are at a life stage transition and have lately been sorting, decluttering, culling, some call it Swedish death cleaning. The old teaching notes, articles from writing a dissertation, letters from long forgotten old boyfriends and girlfriends, records from coaching basketball, all have been flying into the recycle bin. Of course, there are items that are a little more emotionally complicated. What about grandma's pickle dish that we never use? The stained baby clothing, totally useless but redolent with memories. These tangible items, items are just the tip of the iceberg in what needs to be sorted in transitional times, both for individuals and for institutions. There are relationships, identities, activities, traditions, old ideas. These are the tough ones. What do we hold on to? What do we release, let go? Nathan will be talking further about transitions, about holding on and letting go. But I know that in the tough decisions, church people find direction in a community that guides us to sort and prioritize, to hold on and to release in keeping with God's vision of justice, love, and peace. Let's pray. God, be with us in this time of reflection as we pause in the transition between the waning summer and coming fall. We acknowledge your hand and plan in the transitions of our lives. Help us feel contentment in the renewed knowledge of your constant presence and love in all the times of our lives. Good creator, we praise you with joy. Amen.
Good morning. As a new school year kicks off, this becomes a hectic period for families, teachers, and students. Everyone is diving into the routine of early wake-ups and busy schedules. This is also the time of year when faith formation begins again for the children and the youth in the church. We are looking forward to having everyone back together again on Sunday mornings. The Faith Formation Commission will once again coordinate an intergenerational Sunday school time for ages pre-K through high school. Changes being made for this year, including rotating different teachers every month to teach. We also want to better differentiate the material for all ages and break into more even groups to cover the lessons taught. Judy Harder and Tim Hodge will work with the youth to create a Christmas production this year. Practice will begin on November 12th, and right now the Christmas program is scheduled to be at 5 p.m. on December 17th. So parents, if you're listening, and if you can, please let us know soon if you will have a conflict with having that program a week earlier than usual. Sunday school will officially begin on September 3rd. We hope to have three adults join us each month. We sent out a Google survey in July and have only received six responses. Uh, because of this, uh, and we want to recruit more adults to help us, and because of this, we ask anyone interested to please fill out a paper form that is on the table between the two doors in the back. Um, and then I've got a basket that you can leave that in. You can also leave it in my mailbox or in Jill Robb's mailbox, and we will get that and schedule you in for some time this year to be with the Sunday School class. Uh, we had so much fun last year that we just want to see it continue. An email out went out last week to those who have volunteered to be in the nursery. The nursery schedule is printed and is next to the Faith Formation Survey in the back. Please add your name to the schedule if you are interested in volunteering. As of now, we only have a few people signed up. Sunday school orientation will happen today following the Sunday school hour. We will review the Safe Sanctuary video and take some time to answer any questions that teachers and volunteers may have. Please join us if you plan to help in Sunday school or the nursery this year, and we will be serving pizza. So hopefully that will help get you there. <laughs> All right, thank you. Well, good morning, kids. Uh, I can tell you're hungry. I was going to say I hope you're hungry, but because I brought snacks. But you knew I brought snacks. Uh, so I think this is going to probably work better uh, for the snacks if we have some rules about the snacks. Because uh, we don't want to make a mess. So let's see here. Uh, yeah, so we've got some bacon wrapped little smokies right here. And uh, if you're gonna eat those, I think you should take a bowl so that we don't get Smokies or bacon or, or toothpicks on the carpet. Uh, we've got some tongs here. And uh, let's see, so um, yeah, if, if, you don't want, if you don't want them, you don't have to take it. No one's gonna pressure you. Um, you can have as many as you want, but let's make sure everyone gets firsts before anyone takes seconds. Uh, let's do like three Smokies for firsts. Let's make sure everyone who wants some gets some. And then if you need more, you can have seconds. How about that? All right, so uh, who, who wants to go first? Gabby, you wanna go first? Well, there's someone should go first. So we've got these bowls here, so you can just, all right. So while you're working on that, uh, the rest of you, we can all kind of think about this. Do you all have rules for when, when, you, when you're eating at home? Like rules help us here? Do you have rules at home? Like at my house, I don't eat vegetables. Now that's, you, 
Like, you might say that's more of a preference than a rule, but it's pretty close for me. Um, maybe, like, do you wash your hands before you eat? Is that something? No. You don't? Okay, well, that's, it is, I'm, not, I'm not judging here. That's fine. Um, how about, do you pray before you eat? That would be a good thing. Yes. You do pray. Okay. Uh, from what I've seen, another thing would be like at the Rob house, I think you eat until you're done, and then your dad cleans off your plate. Is that, is that a rule, or is that just what happens? That's a rule. Okay, that's a rule. So uh, do, you have any, do you have any other rules besides those? What about elbows on the table? Yeah. Elbows on the table? Do you keep your elbows off the table? Thanks for helping, by the way, Lincoln. You're doing great. You're doing awesome. Yeah, they keep it up at the table at our house. Oh, you have to pay a quarter if you get up, if you get up from the table at the Rob house. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Uh, how about when you have company? Do you have, do you have different rules for when you have company? Like, I'll just say some from my house. When I have company, we eat at the table instead of in front of the TV. <laughs> and if they're fancy company, I'll even put on a clean shirt. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know, do you have anything special you do? Do you, do you uh, have a little bit better manners? Do you say please and thank you, anything like that? We all wear clothes. You all, you all wear clothes when you have company. That's good. Although I feel like I've eaten at the Rob house before when not everyone was wearing a shirt. But that, it was probably hot. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So um, when Jesus was with the disciples, oh, if you want goldfish crackers, too, we got lots of goldfish crackers. Do you like goldfish crackers? You, you can take some for later. Or... Yeah. Crackers? 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 Or you just want to double down on the Smokies, that's fine too. Um, so, when Jesus was with the disciples, their culture, they had lots of rules about food. And these were kind of rules about what they could eat and how it was prepared. And I think some of those rules probably started out just as a way to make sure that people were eating clean food. And some of the rules were probably a way to honor God which is great. But then there were some people, the Pharisees, who followed the rules more to honor themselves than to honor God. And they were kind of like, oh, hey, look at me. I eat perfectly according to the law, and that makes me better than you. Now, that, it, besides being pretty obnoxious, they also just weren't very nice people. So what do you think Jesus thought about that? You think he, you think he thought it was neat? What he said was that you sin, uh, you don't sin as much by the food you put into your mouth as by the words that come out of your mouth. I, th I think that's pretty interesting. Two things that I find interesting about that. The first thing is that Jesus is kind of implying that the rules that people thought were very important about food aren't quite as important as what people thought they were. And the snacks I brought today are actually, they kind of have something to do with a couple of these rules. So one rule is that people were allowed to eat, they, the only fish they could eat were fish that had scales. Now around here, that would pretty much mean carp. And besides a few old timers from Mound Ridge, I don't know a lot of people who'd want to eat carp. Uh, so so that, that wouldn't be a very good snack. But goldfish, also have scales, and that's why I brought goldfish crackers. So another food rule that they had, does anyone need more Smokies? Like, can you need some more? Okay, well, so another rule that they had is that they couldn't eat pork, and that would be a very hard rule for me because I love bacon. And that's why I brought the bacon wrapped little Smokies today, so we can just celebrate that the rules have changed. Like in our faith tradition, we can eat pork, and we can eat fish with scales too, but who wants to? So going back to what Jesus said about sinning with, with your words, it would be kind of nice for us to think that he was just talking to the Pharisees. But really, I think he was talking to all of us. And just, just by a show of hands here, is there anyone here who has never lied or hurt someone's feelings by saying something mean or, or anything like that? I'm thinking, maybe baby Rob, who isn't even born yet. But other than that, I think all the rest of us have. So instead of that, what are some ways that we can use our words for good instead of bad? 
like maybe being a friend of someone who's lonely, or maybe you could say something nice to someone who's having a bad day. Well, when you leave, when you leave today and go to school this week, maybe you can keep thinking about ways that you can use your words for good and do some of those things. Well, so thanks for talking with me today. And let's close with prayer. And then in case any of you are still hungry, I'll take the leftover snacks to the nursery. So let, let's bow for prayer. God, thank you for giving us rules that help us to live better. And please help us to use our words to help people instead of hurting them. Amen. Thanks, Jake. We are asking that the congregation remain seated for verses one and two and three, four, and five. You'll sing together on one and two. The octet will sing three, four, and five. Then stand together as we all sing verses, the last two verses, okay? Remain seated until verse six.
The first scripture reading this morning is Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. That your way may be known upon earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, has blessed us. May God continue to bless us and let all the ends of the earth revere him. Second reading is Matthew 15, 10 through 28. Then he called the crowd to him and he said to them, listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, then both will fall into the pit. But Peter said to him, explain this parable to us. And then he said, are you still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, and slander. These are what defile a person, but not eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she just keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts find faith in you, O God, our rock and our wind and our resonance. This week I dropped our middle child off at college. And as I sat on the bench by one of the residence halls as he tried to figure out where to go to check in, I was not exactly confident in my parental abilities. I was second guessing the ways that I've tried to help him over the years and the ways that I've tried to let him learn things on his own. When to hold and when to let go. When to help and manipulate and try to make things happen and when to say, that's ah, on you, you can do it. 
Maybe I had miscalculated the balance. Maybe my help wasn't actually help, or maybe I should be helping more right now. These times of transition naturally bring up this kind of wandering, this assessing of holding on and letting go. And if we dig a little deeper, it's not just holding on or letting go as if we have the power to really decide. It's not really possible to completely hold on or to completely let go. Unforeseen things happen, or we don't have the power to hold on. And even if we wanted to let go, we can't really because history holds us. Even if there is a loosening, even if there's a break, we are still left holding, but unsure of what. William Stafford, of course, says it better than I can in his poem, Father and Son. The connection between father and son is a metaphor for flying a kite, and then the string breaks, and Stafford is left holding the string, waiting for what tugs. Father and Son by William Stafford. No sound, a spell, on, on, out, where the wind went. Our kite sent back its thrill along the string that sagged but sang and said, I'm here, I'm here, till broke somewhere. Gone years ago, but sailed forever clear of earth. I hold whatever tugs the other end. I hold that string. As I sat with the scripture from Matthew for today, I wondered what string Jesus was holding. What has been broken? What does he need to let go of? What is he still holding on to? Or in other words, what is he grieving? This is a time of transition for him. There had been a number of incidents with the Pharisees previously to what we heard today, but this time we're told that the Pharisees and the scribes came specifically from Jerusalem, and they seemed to have a particular agenda. This was a planned confrontation with Jesus and the disciples, and the disciples reported clearly to Jesus that the Jerusalem Pharisees took offense about what Jesus had said. Previous to this confrontation, we're told of the death of John the Baptist, and I imagine that that hit Jesus pretty hard. I imagine a significant amount of disorientation with Jesus as he grieved his friend's death and wondered about his own future. The story of John the Baptist's death ends by simply saying that John's disciples came and took the body and buried it, and then they went and told Jesus. After that, Jesus is barraged by all kinds of people wanting things from him, and then this encounter with the Pharisees, even though he had tried twice to get away from everyone and pray. Jesus is grieving his friend's death. He probably sees his own death on the horizon. Changes are coming, and now he's pissed off the Pharisees once and for all. What is the string that he's holding on to? What is Jesus' connection with John the Baptist and what he had meant to him? What is his connection to the Pharisees and what they had meant to him? What is his connection to the disciples? What is his connection to the others, to those that have been othered, those like the Canaanite woman who come shouting at him? I imagine all of this to be fairly overwhelming. With the Pharisees, Jesus is focused on the negative, calling them blind, and then talking about the bad things that come out of the mouth, evil intentions, things that grow from the heart and defile. I want him to say good that comes from the mouth, stories, encouragement, poetry, songs. But Jesus is in a negative headspace, and when the Canaanite woman confronts him, he's still in that negative space. When she comes shouting at him, is he just not quite able to see her? not quite able to deal with her, not able to get out of his fog? Is he replaying his relationship with the Pharisees, replaying con uh, previous conversations, 
things that he knows they would say, things that they would have had expected from him. Something like, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Or the Samaritans, the Phoenicians, the Canaanites are all dogs. It is these things that defile the evil intention, evil prejudices, the things he's heard them saying and doing, they come out of Jesus' mouth when talking to the Canaanite woman. Maybe Jesus wonders if he should have held on to that string with the Pharisees. Maybe he's gone too far. He shouldn't have broken that string quite so definitively. Maybe he should try to a little bit more connect with the Pharisees. And then there's the disciples who never seem to get it and want to just protect themselves in Jesus. They have all gone through a lot and probably all feel vulnerable, all feel alone after they're running with the Pharisees. And with Jesus in a bad mood, when the Canaanite woman comes, oh, come on, Jesus, send her away, for she keeps shouting at us. How much energy does it take for Jesus to have to deal with his disciples? Are they helping him, or are they just causing more grief? And will they be able to carry on with his message once he's gone? Are they connected or disconnected to Jesus? Despite all the connections and brokenness and questions and grief, the Canaanite woman pushes in, literally pushes in, and comes and kneels right before Jesus and demands help. And eventually what Jesus sees is, in his words, great faith. Great is your faith. Her faith sparked something within him. It sparked right through his bad mood, and it was cause for celebration. It was cause for healing. It is a contrast from the previous chapter in Matthew when Jesus says to his disciples, you of little faith. Here to the woman, it is great is your faith. And it is in contrast to the next time the disciples try to stop someone from coming to Jesus, and Jesus sternly rebukes them and says, let the children come to me. Great is her faith. It is a line that came tugging right down into Jesus' heart. This is a time of transition, and with this encounter with the Canaanite woman, Jesus regains hold on the string of faith. She tugs on the other end, and Jesus will not deny it. So I, too, loosen my grip on the string and wait for the tug. I don't know when or where or how or from whom. But no matter who is supposed to tug, no matter who you expect to be on the other end, it will emerge if you keep holding on even when it seems like the line is broken. Jesus shows us that journey. As with my sermon from last week, faith is found in that line of women. It was held and given to Jesus when he needed it, and Jesus can hold it loosely, not needing it to be held by the disciples, not needing it to be held by the Pharisees, not needing it to be held by any particular group or person. Jesus can hold it loosely, knowing that it will return. There is always a line. Because faith is... It's not a possession, and that string of faith has strung itself around us, tugging. Faith will appear even when the kite has flown off, and it seems as though the string isn't alive. There's still the wind, your hand, time. Faith will find us if we hold it loosely. I wonder about the Canaanite woman. I wonder about her daughter, that was healed. I wonder how their relationship went after that. Did the Canaanite woman cry out to Jesus when her daughter left home to get married? Did she reflect like I am about holding on and letting go? How did she do it? When that kite eventually breaks and she's left holding the string, how does faith return? In what form does it come tugging? May we be present and attentive, holding on to that string, open to faith's tug in whatever form. It's what I want to be able to do with my son, just to be there holding loosely the other end of the string, finding faith as it emerges. Like the poem ends, I hold whatever tugs.
the other end. I hold that string. That is my prayer. May it be so. Amen.
Join me in prayer. Gracious creator, you've made a wondrous world of sea and sky and land, plants and insects and animals and diverse humans. We thank you for the gifts of late August, the ripe tomatoes and watermelon, the cicadas that sing of Kansas summer, the excitement of children and youth at the beginning of school. You have established the rhythms of the universe with the coming change of season and the inevitable transitions from one human life stage to another. We thank you for your hand in our lives and in all creation. We pray for this world and all its resources. The heat, the drought, the storms, the wildfires all cry out for our attention. Help us to care for your creation and to play our part in repairing the damage we have done. We pray for those places and people that have been devastated by the results of climate change, and particularly now for the people of Maui as they struggle with trauma and loss. We come to you knowing that we are far from perfect. We have turned away from our neighbor in need, both near and far. Forgive us for our belief that we deserve our privileges for our hesitancy to take responsibility for our settler mentality and for our part in oppressive systems. God, give us courage to sing a new world into being, even when the notes don't always come out right. Prod us to sort through our lives, letting go of prejudice and small-mindedness and worn-out traditions and routines. Help us to prioritize what is good and hold tight to the string of your truths. Empower us to feed the hungry, feed the captive, find the lost, and even upset religion when needed. Merciful God, comfort those who mourn the recent loss of loved ones or mark the anniversaries of past losses. Lift up those who are dealing with injury or illness or a new condition or treatment. Walk beside those whose health has come to an unwelcome turning point. Bring healing, bring acceptance and gratitude for what has been. Bring confidence in your constant presence, whatever may come. Be with those who are troubled, those who are worried, stressed, or tired. Help us to, together, envelop all those around us, family, neighbors, rivals, with your love. Finally, God, we ask that you hear our prayers, guide us, and sustain us through all the times and transitions of our lives. We thank you for your connecting string, always present in our lives. Amen.
May we go forth in the words of the hymn, attentive to compassion's flow like waters, pouring balm for all who grieve, singing a new world into being, living the promise we believe. Amen.